So, good morning, everyone. Today, there will be next lecture, next topic in our course of advanced quantum mechanics. And uh, that will be rather special topic. I will talk namely about uh, coherent states. Oh, my pen doesn't write. About coherent states. Um, interesting point. Coherent looks a word which you can understand, but there are different uh, ways to understand coherence. I will um, tell you shortly, sir, uh, later in this lecture. So please don't um, get confused. If you tell a state a co coherent, um, it doesn't mean anything. Coherent state is given by a certain formula, has certain properties, we will learn about this, but that's in a, a, a way in which it's coherent, doesn't have to coincide uh, with the way you define it. So it is just a name, it's uh, easier to perceive it just as a name for a certain group, certain class of states. Um, I will spend about um, a half of the lecture talking about a simple coherent state in detail. Mostly I will be talking about a single solitaire. Uh, so it is uh, hardly advanced quantum mechanics. When we learn everything about coherent state and this setup, we can easily go to more complex setups, to more uh, interesting systems. So we will revise our concept of laser uh, if you remember, there was a discrepancy, there was a confusion about the laser in the last lecture when we talk about transitions, right? It doesn't seem to be clear how if we correctly describe the laser in the picture of transitions. Now we get kind of true picture. Uh, we will talk about uh, coherent states of particles when, um, like, um, uh, for coherent states of radiations, radiation, which we mostly talked about, uh, there are also a certain number of particles. Somewhere. We will. Uh, uh, get an example out of that so called Cooper pair box, um, a device which is related to quantum computing devices. So, there's a plan for today. Coherent states is an interesting topic by itself, uh, but we also will apply it further in the course when we will talk about dissipation and especially about transitions in the presence of dissipation. Good, that was outline. As usual, perhaps a little bit long, but I really want to um, give you some idea of what is um, coming. Uh, right. Uh, let me start the lecture in a bit uh, untraditional, but from other hand, all very old-fashioned way. 
let me start it with um, words of uh, wisdom coming from wise people, great physicists, which from time to time have eliminating sentences. All right, so I believe you know this guy. This is Albert Einstein, right? Um, uh, you might remember that he was a famous scientist. He was also a Nobel Prize winner. And uh, if you would think, uh, how did he get Nobel Prize? You would think that's because, because of relativity theory, special relativity or um, uh, general relativity. In fact, he got Nobel Prize for the discovery of fault effect, how one quantum of uh, light interact with electrons. So, and uh, although he did not quite accepted quantum mechanics, he had uh, his own vision of all this. Uh, what he said once is extremely helpful for a quantum phys a physicist. Let me cite it. The sale of beer in pintle bottles doesn't imply that beer exists only in indiv indivisible pint portions. Uh, right, with beer it's a bit uh, trivial because well, from everyday experience we can uh, we can uh, uh, convince ourselves that the saying is uh, very right. Uh, but eventually uh, he was talking about um, photons, about quantization in oscillators. And uh, right, since we have uh, less everyday experience um, in quantum mechanics, uh, then this saying is eventually non trivial, and the uh, coherent state gives a kind of mathematical answer, um, mathematical example of uh, the realization of this saying. Uh, right, Einstein got his discovery in 1905. Um, in about 100 years after, uh, after that, there was uh, another famous person, Professor Glober, um, who got Nobel Prize um, uh, for a series of works which uh, utilized this coherent state. And um, right, what did he say? Something, yeah, perhaps it's a bit longer and more scientific, but in fact about the same. Um, such states, and for us that would be coherent states, must have indefinite numbers of quantum present. Only in that way, now a little bit of poetry, uh, they remain unchanged when one quantum is uh, removed. Well, unchanged is a bit of a poetry. We'll see how does it. Um, uh, go in practice, but it gave, it's uh, also a good description of uh, coherent state and problems which this state eventually resolves uh, in uh, kind of in words, in wise words. Um, good, uh, so sorry for a little bit unusual um, uh, beginning of my lecture. I really like these citations, especially about beer, uh, um, it's really profound. <coughs> right. To understand uh, what is uh, all about, let us talk about uh, fortunes which, as we know, 
are well it's it, it just a big set of cost selectors and it's very convenient very um, um, constructive to talk about uh, uh, basis states in Fox space and each basis state of this type is just determined by a number of quanta in each of the oscillators, a long set of integer numbers. Yep. But the point is that uh, it is a stationary state, a state with given energy, which uh, uh, corresponds to one of the basis states uh, of the of the Fox space. Eventually, quantum mechanics uh, allows for uh, way more freedom, and uh, an arbitrary state of the field can be a well, in principle, an arbitrary superposition of these basic states. All right. There is a price to pay for this. This state, the superposition, cannot be stationary state, cannot have certain energy. Uh, one can see that from the fact that coefficients here they are oh, time dependent as for stationary states. So this time dependency, uh, let's see, yeah, I missed a tick here, sorry. Uh, this time dependence cannot, uh, cannot be disregarded. Uh, right. In principle, uh, existence of such superpositions is uh, general quantum mechanical um, state. Because uh, general quantum mechanical postulate, it can occur in any quantum system. Uh, why do we talk uh, especially about radiation, about uh, photons? Uh, well, that comes from um, obvious uh, reason. If you would talk about electrons, the number of particles would be rather fixed, while photons, uh, they can be absorbed and emitted by matter as we studied in detail last time. Uh, so the number doesn't have to be constant. It's easy to imagine that the number is changed and perhaps it gets to a superposed state. Uh, also, unlike electrons, uh, photons can be cre created by kicks. We will uh, study it in detail, but uh, just uh, uh, understand this. We can excite an oscillator just by shaking it, by um, kicking it, and um, it will get some number of particles. So, uh, conservation of number of particles is much uh, uh, less rigid for our photons. That's why a superposition uh, uh, easily appear in the context of radiation. But this is uh, again a general quantum mechanical postulate. So later in the lecture, we will also talk about coherent states uh, of the particles. Uh, fine. So what I just said, it's uh, that um, uh, photon uh, field uh, can be in a superposition of uh, base states uh, of the states with certain number of photons. That's uh, about the period, right? So uh, there can be superposition of uh, 
say, three bottles and two bottles of beer. Uh, right. Let me start with classical physics. It is specific for our oscillator that classical physics is very similar to quantum one can be uh, readily mapped one to each other. Let us see explicitly. Uh, let me first um, understand what happens when you excite an oscillator. So what I've made an oscillator from capacitance and inductance. And I also add a voltage source to excite it. Uh, right, so what are, what is dynamics, what are equations uh, governing dynamics of the uh, oscillators? Uh, right, first it's uh, current conservation in the circuit, so um, change of uh, charge current is just time derivative of uh, voltage in this capacitor. And there's induction law, change of um, time change of current will induce a voltage and the uh, external voltage is a part of it. All right, so we have two coupled uh, differential equations, very simple. If there's no current, uh, sorry, if there's no voltage, then we expect uh, the oscillator just to be uncharged. Zero current, zero voltage, and then we give a pulse of voltage. All right, upon a pulse, uh, the, the state of oscillator changes somehow, uh, but if the pulse is gone, we still have oscillations. Since we don't consider any dissipation, it's a bit idealized oscillator. Well, this oscillation just persists ideal oscillation with a frequency frequency given by um, capacitance and inductance. All right, good. It's an uh, easy piece of uh, classical physics. Uh, with some sweat, you can solve these equations. You can find amplitude of the resulting oscillation. Uh, let me look at these uh, equations and transform it in a certain way, um, bringing it a little bit closer to quantum mechanics. Let us recall convenient coordinates, which we um, call uh, normal coordinates. Well, convenient and normal, uh, not always concise, but in this case, uh, they do. Uh, right, so we the coefficients in this relation, they're really tricky, they're ugly square roots, which we have discussed so far. Uh, but anyway, there is a variable of this real part proportional to voltage and imaginary part proportional to the current, eh? uh, right? And um, uh, for this particular variable, complex normal coordinate, uh, the equation becomes very simple. So modulus of D just remains the same at without voltage pulse and uh, the the uh, voltage comes here as a source. It comes here as a source. Uh, yeah, it also requires some uh, strange coefficient in these units. Uh, very good. Let me um, uh, plot what has happened with an oscillator.
um, in terms of d right again uh, real part of this voltage uh, imagine part is a current so before the pulse it was at zero uh, during the pulse it evolved somehow it reached some position of d now pulse is uh, over and it uh, rotates in this Um, with a frequency given by a frequency uh, of oscillator. Well, uh, if uh, since rotation is uniform, we can go to a system of coordinates which rotates with the same angular velocity. Then, um, which corresponds to mathematical uh, mathematical um, um, transformation. Um, uh, right. So this, uh, if you go, uh, if you look at D naught instead of instead of uh, D. Um, we got, we got, uh, we got different coordinates. In this case, uh, we are in a system which rotates, uh, rotates um, uh, in the same velocity. So now I have a question. In coordinates of D naught, how this plot would like. Especially I wonder about the structure of the plot after the pulse. Well, it's clear that anyway, it will start, uh, it will start uh, at zero and it, it will evolve something during the pulse. Right, but what happens uh, after the pulse? So, D naught instead of D. Uh, right, who can answer the question? Right, somebody has answered, I hope. Oh, it's again, it is, it, it, uh, it, it happens so frequently that I have a difficulty to assess a chat window. I should stop for sure for a second. It stays at one uh, point. Excellent, Mohammed. Yeah, it stays at one point. Sir, so we have um, uh, a state, excited state of an oscillator, which is imagined as one point in this plane. Very convenient to uh, avoid unnecessary, unnecessary um, rotation. Uh, right, uh, let me get back. Uh, right, so we're still classical mechanics. We just plot oscillatory convenient coordinate. So if it's D, it is a circle. If it's D naught, it's just a point in this plane. Uh, fine. Now for some reasons I cannot. Yeah. All right, so we kicked a uh, uh, classical oscillator. Now let us do the same with a quantum oscillator. Okay how we can proceed. Um, as usual in quantum mechanics, we need to write a Hamiltonian. It is a rather usual Hamiltonian, which is equivalent to Hamiltonian of uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, right, so it can be written in terms of uh, um, annihilation and creation operators with this particular oscillator. 
And next to it, we have a term which describes external voltage source. Very good. If we would derive Heisenberg equations, the resulting equations will be precisely equivalent to um, to um, uh, what we got in terms of uh, operators uh, I and um, V. Um, and I will go to a Heisenberg picture. Let me first uh, derive, um, rewrite this uh, Hamiltonian in a more quantum form. Again, the same Hamiltonian, but in different coordinates in different notations. All right, that part, of course, becomes that familiar expression for harmonic oscillator. And the voltage, external voltage, will come in this terms. Right, so this term is quadratic in uh, in um, creation motion apparatus, this term is not. It's the first power of B and um, B um, dagger. We know that such apparatus in a later create hot answer. We can kind of conclude that time dependent voltage will create hot change our number. Uh, good, starting this uh, Hamiltonian, let us uh, derive Heisenberg equations for um, apparatus creation, relation operator. Uh, right, this part of the question, we know, and uh, this part describes a new part uh, describes the voltage source uh, right so it's linear equation it's easy to solve we solve that and what we see is the following the resulting annihilation uh, operator has two terms. First term is uh, the one without any uh, voltage source applied. And this part describes voltage source. It describes it in terms of the solution for in the uh, in, uh, classical uh, normal coordinates, D. Uh, sure, how we can summarize this, Creation and annihilation apparatus for this time dependent situation just acquire additions. And this addition is not an operator, it's just a number. It is a, a number which corresponds to the solution of classical. Right, uh, that's Heisenberg picture. It is uh, very convenient. And the further way, uh, when we talk about dissipation, we will apply this Heisenberg picture quite a lot. But we are about states. We want to look at coherent states. So, <coughs> we uh, let me get some perhaps a boring piece of algebra to get a state, to get uh, the same in Schrodinger picture. Uh, right, so we want to start. Let us say we start with a vacuum, no uh, photon, there is no, there is nature, uh, there is no excitation in this oscillator. And then we will um, use the correspondence between 
operators in uh, uh, Heisenberg picture and operators in Schrodinger picture. So again, uh, two pictures, they correspond to two different representations, alternative representations. And in Heisenberg representation, uh, the state does not change, it remains, it remains vacuum. Uh, while in Schrodinger picture, it does change and it, we want to determine the state, right? And this is operating Schrodinger in um, Heisenberg picture, this is in, um, in um, Schrodinger picture. Uh, good. Since it's valid for arbitrary operator, it would be valid for arbitrary function of f. All right. But we uh, know actually the relation between b in Heisenberg picture and b in Schrodinger picture. They just differ by time-dependent shift. So, matrix element of any function is just a shift. Uh, right? So, if I compute expectation value of any function of annihilation operator with the state which I search for, I understand that in this function I need to replace operator by a number. What does it mean? The only way to realize it is to make this function an eigenfunction of this annihilation operator. So anytime the operator works in the function, it just gives you a constant, certain constant which is determined by characteristics of the pulse, by the characteristics of excitation of the oscillator. So we come in closer to coherent state. This is coherent state. This is the general definition of a coherent state for an oscillator. It is given by eigenvalue equation. If uh, annihilation works in this function, function it just gives a constant. Uh, this constant can be different, can be anything. For for any constant, we will find a coherent state. For those who kind of been dealing with the organization with eigenvalues for a long time, like a quantum mechanics, um, um, first idea would be to say that these states, which would correspond to different eigenvalues, are orthogonal. Indeed, if instead of B, we would have a Hamiltonian of that, of a sort, these states will be orthogonal. But we are not dealing with Hermitian operator here. Annihilation operator is not Hermitian. That's why different coherent states, which differ in lambda, are in fact not orthogonal. We will see this explicitly in several minutes. Right, so fortunately the equation we are dealing with is uh, very simple. We can solve it analytically uh, rather fast and efficiently. All right, so let me start with the definition. 
and let me understand that it cannot be a state with a fixed number of photons, right? Because uh, any time the number of photons is changed by this operator. Let us find it. So how to find it? Let us uh, try rather general, uh, general expression. Let us uh, look at this wave function in terms of the superposition. So those are states with fixed number of photons, uh, bosons, whatever quanta, and uh, those are coefficients in this superposition. All right, and then now we can express matrix elements of an elation operator in this representation. So it is square root of n if uh, uh, number of particles uh, um, gets uh, smaller by one, otherwise it's zero. Good, so we apply to substitute this uh, here. That's what we got. And look, this is recurrent equation. So for instance, if we know um, uh, psi at zero, we know psi at one, if we know psi at one, we know psi at two, recurrent relation. which is generally um, written like this. Not every recurrent relation one can solve. That particular one one can, right? Let's see what we get. We got a lot of, lots of uh, lambda and um, a lambda to the power of n. And all these factors are just collected into square root of the factorial. Fine. So we express all elements in terms of uh, element at zero. Uh, what do we have to do uh, now? This is a question. Again, I don't see chart window. There's some interference between my programs, but I don't see also anything in the chat. Let's see. Let me stop sharing. Let me look uh, at the chart. So please, I want to have an answer. What is the next step in the derivation? We made it uh, several times. Uh, we made similar derivations several times in the course. So we know wave function actually upon a factor. We don't know this phi naught. Uh, right, so what is the next step? How to obtain this phi naught? Uh, right, right, right. Thank you very much. Perfect answers. We need to normalize these functions and everything will be fine. Let us do this. Let us normalize. Oops. Right. This is expression, sure, normalization. Uh, eventually that looks terrible, but we can sum up it very easily if you recall the definition of exponent, right? What we find here is a tail expansion of uh, such an exponent. From this, we can figure out what phi naught is and find explicit 
form of a coherent photon state. Uh, let us see. Let us have a, a break now. It finds the transparency. So we got the explicit form of a coherent photon state. It's simple mathematics, still we need uh, to have some visualization. I'm going to provide uh, such a uh, um, visualization now. All right, mm, to start with, let us compute average number of uh, photons in uh, a coherent state. All right, since uh, we've got a kind of power series, the result is easy to compute, and it just L's lambda squared. Therefore, lambda is a follows. Remember, lambda is a complex number. It all depends on the pulse and the phase of the pulse. Uh, uh, right, and uh, look at the modulus of lambda, square root of number of atoms, and there is extra degree of freedom. Uh, there is uh, a phase factor. This phase factor contains this time dependent part, but as uh, for this picture, this uh, um, Trivial time dependence can be cancelled if you go to the system of coordinates which uh, rotates uh, with the same angular velocity, right? So, for classical system to remind, we would have a, just a point on the plot in the circumstances. For coherent state, it's kind of uh, looks a bit uh, um, dogmatic, but let me uh, say it now. Coherent state in this uh, coordinates is depicted as a circle. The position of the center of the circle uh, coincides with the classical position. So it's kind of a circle approximation to a point. And the radius of the circle is uh, one fourth. Uh, let us take it at dogmatic level at the moment. Uh, right, uh, this is coherent state. So it is a point, at least it looks like a point if it's sufficiently far from the center, if number of uh, average number of photo, uh, photons is big. Uh, how about a state with a given number of photons? Well, how we can picture it in these coordinates? We, that is just constant and the phase can be arbitrary. So a state with a given number of photons is a circle in this picture, right? So the radii of these circles are quantized. They are proportional to square root of m. That's why uh, distant circles uh, become closer and closer to each other, right? Uh, that's why this uh, uh, state which is pictured um, can I perhaps zoom into it? Uh, no. Uh, which is pictured uh, as a circle. Uh, we can see it here. It uh, encompasses uh, several many photon states. Good. Let's get it a bit to formulas. Let's get the, uh, let's understand why this uh, circle uh, appears in this context. Uh, to this, um, let us understand what is the distribution of number of uh, 
photons in a coherent state. To this end, we just uh, square the coefficients which obtained, and I would express uh, modulus lambda, uh, uh, modulus lambda squared as uh, as in terms of average number of photons. Good. What we got is uh, pretty much known in physics. It's Poisson distribution, distribution of independent processes. Right. Uh, this Poisson distribution is different for different values of parameters, which is average n. And if this average n appears to be big, this Poisson distribution can be easily approximated with a Gaussian function, normal distribution. The spread of this normal distribution is uh, square root of n. Uh, right? Recall this is uh, something which we have uh, talked about a week ago. Distribution of number of photons in the in a laser. Poisson distribution, which can be approximated as Gaussian one. Um, fine. And that also explains why did I draw a circle in the previous slide? Well, it's just an approximation of a Gaussian function with, uh, with uh, something like uh, whatever a box. So the radius of the circle is uh, related to uh, mean squared square derivation, deviation of this Gaussian function. Uh, let me flash it again, this circle. Uh, good. We understand how to visualize a coherent state. Um, let me... Keep. Okay, let, 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 let me tell you, uh, sh sh very shortly tell you about Poisson and Boltzmann distribution just because it was um, an issue uh, many uh, years ago. So let me recall that, um, for instance, uh, sunlight. Uh, the spectrum of sunlight is very close to black body radiation and the distribution of a uh, number of photons is um, determined by temperature, KMBT. And uh, right, if you plot it versus N, right, there will be exponent, will be falling function. As to coherent, uh, as to po uh, Poisson distribution, which comes with coherent states, um, then we just discussed it. It's a uh, normal distribution uh, fixed at some uh, at some average number of photons. Good, very good. So I, I illustrate the difference with the plot. And just to keep you attentive, um, uh, multiple choice uh, questions. This plot, which is not made by me, I've taken it from an article. This plot uh, has been drawn, uh, yeah approximately give me others of the value um, 100 years ago. Ten years ago. One year ago. The Fifty ago. Uh, need another option. 
five years ago. All right, why don't we vote? So there's a plot which uh, gives you distribution of black body radiation and uh, um, distribution of number of photons in the coherent state. Uh, I don't think I see many answers from you. Hello. One should be able to um, kind of process um, implicit information in this plot. Uh, right, it looks like uh, D is popular, there are some A's. Yeah, but mostly uh, people go for D. And uh, that's eventually a correct answer. I don't know how do you uh, come to this. Um, Somebody who um, did D, uh, Robert, may I ask you to, uh, to explain your choice? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, well, it felt like the most likely. Yes, uh, uh, I, I don't, hear, don't hear you. Can you? Okay, can you hear me now? I don't think it worked, I um, cannot hear you. Um, Anyway, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that doesn't work. Let me explain the, cho uh, the choices. Uh, uh, let me uh, get to show on screen again. Um, kind of shortest explanation is that uh, this picture should appear in the context of uh, laser physics. 100, year, 100 years ago, nobody would think about uh, coherent state in radiation business. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, well, as you can see from the quality of the plot, uh, it's not a modern quality. Most likely, uh, such this plot has been done just, you know, by hand. It, uh, doesn't it, it sounds ridiculous uh, nowadays but it is uh, quite a, a possibility so that excludes all these options right and we end up with uh, uh, answer D uh, which is um, which is um, just uh, the uh, beginning of uh, laser error in physics. Good. For some reasons, uh, most of you kind of uh, figured out the correct answer. Uh, let's go uh, uh, there and let us recognize that eventually, uh, let's talk about an aspect of coherent state and let's recognize that it's a, a, a eventually very old stuff. And Cahillon state has almost the same age as the quantum mechanics by itself. Uh, just long, 
pretty long time ago, Schrodinger wanted to understand more about uncertainty relation, right? And he looked at it a little bit mathematically, um, like a mathematical problem to find a function of a function without any physical system, without any Hamiltonian, which minimizes this uncertainty relation. Okay, he has found a state which is Gaussian distribution of X. And uh, if you look at it, uh, we can recall that this is eventually a vacuum state of an oscillator. This is, was, was a particular state uh, where um, averages of uh, momentum and um, the coordinate was zero. Suppose they're non-zero. One can write it the same and get a similar formula with shifted x, shifted momentum, and that is coherent state, right? Uh, so what is the bottom line? Coherent state eventually optimizes the uncertainty for oscillation. So uh, one of the reasons that the, a, a vacuum is also a coherent state, and indeed at, at, uh, it is a coherent state for uh, lambda equals zero. And all other states uh, can be obtained from vacuum by shifts. Well, that is uh, pretty easy to see from the visualization I gave to you. So we could put initially coherent state um, um, in the origin to the vacuum. Then we shift it, for instance, by kicking oscillator. It gets there, it remains unchanged in shape. Fine, I guess uh, this is uh, all we have to know about coherent state in general. Um, let me utilize it. Ah, okay, uh, I have to say a word about uncertainty relations which will become, become uh, useful when we talk about uh, particles. Uh, let me do it simple. Uh, let me just look at this circle. Uh, and let me do, do this circle in polar coordinates. Uh, let me understand uh, the um, delta n, which corresponds to the radius uh, one fourth, and delta phi. Good. Delta n we have in fact already computed. This is a spread of number of photons. Square root of n. And okay, that can be now uh, obtained from uh, geometric reasoning. Phase uncertainty. As we can see from this plot, it's uh, one over n squared. So we obtain funny formula. Again, it's about optimization of uncertainties. We have found that uncertainty in number of photons and uncertainty in phase satisfy this relation. Fine. With this, let me go further. Let me make an important but rather trivial extensive extension of that. Let me from uh, one oscillator mode go to many modes as we did many times in this course. Uh, right, I just draw the formula, so uh, coherent state uh, can be a direct product of coherent states for all these modes. For each mode, we have an individual coherent state with k and corresponding lambda k. Different oscillators can be excited 
very differently. And uh, this gives us coherent states of electromagnetic radiation. What is important? Any classical configuration on the field, any solution of a Maxwell equation can be associated with a coherent state in very much the same fashion as any um, uh, excitation of classical oscillator can be associated with a coherent state. For a single oscillator, it was just, uh, you know, this uh, solution of classi uh, classical equation uh, what was that the square root of h i believe um right and uh, for um for um classical uh, electrodynamics it looks a bit complicated so let us see for any a lambda for any parameter of coherent state, I can find classical field configuration. Well, if I run uh, Fourier transform up with that, I can extract uh, lambdas out of this classical configuration. So this formula can be easily made work in both ways. All right. So, uh, that uh, kind of uh, does uh, the same uh, as, as we did for single oscillator, mm -hmm. does it for infinite number of oscillators. That remains uh, the most important uh, property. Also, coherent state has minimum uncertainty. It means, and that you can hear um, frequently in different books, that the, a, a coherent state gives the best approximation of a classical state, classical configuration of electromagnetic field. Good, we've done it for uh, many modes. Now we can, um, uh, yeah, we have several modes. I've been talking about arbitrary superposition. Coherent state is certainly not arbitrary superposition. Uh, this uh, structure with the lambdas uh, is very certain. Uh, from the other hand, it has the same arbitrariness as uh, um, uh, arbitrariness of classical solution for any classical solution. One can find one to one correspondence um, with a coherent. Let me now get back to, to uh, a single mode, that's practical mode, lazy mode. And let me understand how coherent state can be used in this context. And here we got lots of uh, semantical problems. Uh, they say that uh, laser light is uh, highly coherent. Highly coherent in optical sense. It means that first it's a monochromatic. It uh, oscillates at the same frequency. But also the phase of this oscillation uh, is preserved either for infinite time or for a long time. This is a property of, uh, which is called coherence in optics. It is not quantum coherence. It uh, can be pretty, uh, pretty much classical light. Uh, Sir, so it is not 
by no means obviously that coherent laser light is uh, described by a coherent state. But it does. Actually, uh, we could uh, see some hints out of that in a previous calculation when we computed the distribution of number of photons in laser and find it almost Poissonian. One can associate it with the distribution of number of photons in uh, Poisson in um, coherent state. And uh, it is uh, the same um, distribution. What is the distinctive distinction? In previous lecture, we assume that at any time the laser in a state with a certain number of uh, photons and then it has to jump between these two states and this is not what uh, laser uh, light does it doesn't jump otherwise it won't be coherent uh, so in fact a uh, better answer is to say that the laser in a coherent state. Then, in fact, it is in a single state. It does have to jump. But Uh, the distribution of number of photons is still uh, correct, is still, uh, you have a square root of n spread in the distribution of number of photons. Good. Then we can also get uh, an answer uh, from uh, many symbol textbooks, which is uh, also rather semantic. Well, they say that the laser is in a coherent state. It's an approximation again. Coherent state is very useful to describe laser, but it's not really an exact description. So let me address this question. Let me, uh, I don't want to introduce too ma ma uh, much mathematics, but uh, some physical concepts should come into this class. Uh, right. Um, let me first uh, understand that uh, lasers are subject to noise. Let us call, let us call it quantum noise. And uh, to Understand this concept, it is better to start with a laser which is switched off. And uh, in this case, I would uh, just consider a mode, laser mode, which can only lose our chance. We know with which rate it, 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 it does, sir. Well, it is defined by quality factor of uh, lazy mode, inverse quality factor. Good, uh, let us see. If it were classic, uh, we would have an equation like this. Relaxation equation, which describes uh, damping of laser light with this time constant. It would, uh, after a short time, uh, lambda would become zero, right? So this equation would just describe uh, at any initial condition lambda, it would just describe the motion towards zero. But that is uh, not um, a quantum mechanical uh, because according to quantum mechanics, it cannot stay at zero. There must be some distribution 
the mass be um, spread of lambdas at uh, the radius of the rotor of, um, of course, uh, uh, right, uh, how to achieve this. This is achieved by adding a random noise to this equation, random time dependent noise, which is called uh, quantum noise. It is white noise. It is described by an amplitude, uh, amplitude of the noise. And this amplitude should be chosen in a very certain way. This amplitude should uh, be made such that the actual distribution uh, uh, of uh, quantum state in the oscillator is reproduced from this equation. Good, sir. So, uh, what is the uh, model for dynamics we have uh, we have now? There is a central force. which uh, drives lambdas towards zero. And there is a Brownian motion, some random force, which, uh, which uh, pulls it in uh, all sides and which deviates it from the center. One can characterize the situation with a diffusion uh, coefficient which is in these units um, is of the order of um, uh, time required uh, for uh, for laser to lose uh, uh, for chance. All right, let's switch the laser on. What has happened? There is again, there is a gain at low numbers of partners. There is also a loss. And these are compensated at certain number of photons. On a circle in this plane we consider today. With a radius proportional to square root of average number of photons. All right, so uh, a coherent state. A coherent state would go to this uh, uh, radius, but its position in phase is not really uh, well defined. That's why if we take into account quantum noise, it won't stay just in place. It would move. It would move in random fashion along this circle. Sir, so we deal with Brownian motion along the circle. Uh, right. So now what is uh, quantum coherence time? Quantum coherence time is a time to lose one photon from the laser. Uh, by losing one photon, this uh, coherent state gets a kick, moves a little bit. Uh, but to change its phase significantly, to go around the circle, very many such Kicks are required if uh, if the radius is uh, big, right? That will give us estimation for coherence time. Okay, it can be uh, computed from the diffusion. Uh, anyway, it is n times larger than the quantum coherence time. So in average, uh, to uh, have a change of optical phase by 2 pi, uh, a, a laser should lose uh, n photons, uh, kind of all 
radiation which is accumulated in the laser should be completely renewed. Okay, in this case, uh, there will be uh, there will be a change of optical phase of the rod of two pi. All right, so we understood that the state of the laser is a coherent state for a rather short time period, shorter than this time. If you look at longer time scales, it is not a coherent state, it is a state obtained from circulation of this coherent state uh, from Brownian motion of the state. Good. That was about the lasers. I should uh, look at uh, time. Uh, I should find time to talk about coherent states of the particles. Till now, we've been talking mostly about um, uh, photons, but well, photons uh, uh, are coming from oscillators. It can be um, can be related to any oscillator. Let me look at something different. Let me talk about coherent state of uh, particles. There are many interesting uh, semantical terms here. So. Um, let me play a bit with this. Uh, for photons, for radiation, coherent state, um, is uh, very analogous to classical state as we learned for any classical state one can find a coherent state and vice versa for particles classical usually means uh, a state with fixed number of particles so uh, what is a coherent state for particles in fact we have gotten already so, when we talked about super phenomena, about uh, basic condensate or bosons, uh, about superconductivity in fermionic system. And the states of the condensate superconductors are macroscopic states are characterized by a phase, superconducting phase or condensate phase. So this is uh, um, incompatible with fixed number of particles, so it looks like coherent state superposition of the states with different number of particles. And uh, right, what we can say. These coherent states for real Bose condensates, for real superconductors, are really large microscopy. So uh, classical. So that's what we can say as a conclusion. Uh, coherent state is in fact classical state, but for quantum fluid for quantum uh, material. Right, uh, and in the end of, in the, um, uh, end of this presentation and in, in the end of this lecture, I would just like to illustrate this um, interplay of the states with fixed phase and the states with fixed number of particles. Uh, let me um, do this with a concrete device, but before I will show you a device, let me talk a bit uh, uh, general. Let me take uh, a superconductor for simplicity, but it can be also a um, uh, bosonic quantum liquid. It could be um, uh, superfluid. Um, 
Uh, right. Uh, let me start perhaps with the uh, with um, uh, what I um, told about uncertainty in coherent state. So there was uncertainty between number of photons and the phase which characterizes state. Uncertainty was uh, one half. And one can make an analogy between uncertainty for momentum and coordinate in quantum mechanics. Okay, in this case, one needs to divide it by h bar, but it's just on the factor. Uh, inspired by this uh, equation, one can talk about number of particles and the phase as operators with properties uh, similar to momentum and coordinate. And we know that these uh, operators, momentum and coordinate, obey canonical um, commutation relations. So one can assume that the same relation holds for two operators of number particle and the phase. Uh, good. Having understood that, regarding it as a quantum uncertainty, let underst uh, understand two very limiting, very different cases. Let me consider a bulk of quantum liquid. Infinite system. In this case, we know that the phase is fixed. It also means that the number of particles is not fixed. Eventually, we've mentioned this when we talk about the uh, ground state of a superconductor. It did not okay. correspond okay. to a certain number mm -hmm. of particles. Yeah. Uh, right, how to write it in terms of wave function. Uh, wave function in phase representation would be just delta function of phase. Wave function in uh, representation of uh, charge. Mm -hmm number of particles uh, would be Fourier transformation. So we go from coordinate to momentum, we apply Fourier transform. All right, and that has uh, uh, equal probability to have uh, all possible number of particles. That was the bulk. Let us consider an island or a droplet of quantum uh, liquid. And in this droplet, number of particles have to stay the same. So the number is fixed. It also means that it cannot be simultaneously in a state with definite size. If I would sketch with the same uh, rules, uh, wave function in the phase space, it will have equal probabilities for any phase. Uh, what is um, Two idealized uh, cases, very clear what is not satisfactory at the moment are the variations of uh, number and phase, really infinite in two pictures. But variations are somehow connected to, might be connected to energies. It could be energy costs for this, which we don't take into account. 
uh, also these cases are completely disconnected. Uh, it would be nice to have more physical illustration uh, of uh, this concept, how to go from a stateless fixed number of particles, uh, which has to be for an island, uh, for the case uh, of um, infinite number of particles. Uh, sorry, for the case of uncertain number of particles. This is a device. It can be actually made in uh, the labs, uh, and I guess um, uh, people in QTech uh, can make such devices or similar devices. Uh, let's just see. It is uh, uh, equivalent to a superconducting island, which is connected to a bulk where face is fixed and it's good to put it to zero, it doesn't matter. And uh, it is connected to this by a um, link which is called Josephson Junction. Uh, and uh, we, can we can try to figure out uh, whether it is in the state of uh, certain phase or certain number of particles. If this link is infinitely small, it has to be in a state with a definite number of particles. If the link is uh, sufficiently strong, then it has to be in a state with a given uh, phase. Uh, right, what I want to say about this device, uh, given a relatively short time left. First of all, let me localize uh, the island in this picture. Picture is colorful, uh, but it might be confusing. So the island is eventually uh, that long stick. The island has to be small. Uh, and uh, the Josephson junctions are here. As to the bulk superconductor, it's kind of made from uh, uh, both metals. So a contact over here, it's very good. So this metallic island and this one, they are just the same. They are all uh, parts of the superconducting valve. Uh, once again, uh, this is uh, the island. And this is a connection. Fine. Um, uh, that was uh, physical. Let me sketch a couple of Hamiltonians. Uh, Hamiltonian. It should depend on two operators which represent charge and uh, superconducting phase. Uh, this is charging energy. And you see it pays energy cost for variation of charge with respect to some average charge. It's proportional to square root of uh, N to charge fluctuations. This is Josephson energy. This is a function of phase. If one considers small phases, The cosine can be expanded uh, minus here, minus here gives you plus. So in fact, this is phase fluctuation and you also pay uh, energy cost for that. 
Right, from uh, now we can already see that this term, if this energy is big, Johnson energy, it tries to squeeze um, a wave function in the phase. While this term squeezes wave function in charge. Um, good. There was a way to solve uh, this Hamiltonian in general, and uh, yeah, the, the, this way should be um, is rather straightforward. Uh, one uses um, again the commutation relations between operator n. So n here it looks like uh, momentum. It can be therefore represented as a, as an operator as a uh, time derivative. Uh, sorry, derivative with respect to phase. One can make a Hamiltonian. One can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Uh, one can solve for function in um, uh, phase representation or charge representation. Let me talk about the results. Uh, the results uh, are easy to understand in two limiting cases. First, let us try to consider a charging energy, which is much bigger than Josephson energy. In this case, the state of this island uh, wants to be a state of definite charge. And indeed, if we plot uh, energies of the states of the island versus a parameter, um, which is uh, average charge in the island, we find parabolas, and each parabola corresponds to a definite value of discrete charge. Uh, parabolas are shifted. Uh, now, let me uh, try to understand what is happening in the ground state. So I try to put more and more charge in my system. In the ground state, uh, I have to connect lowermost pieces of uh, all parabolas. Uh, while on a piece, uh, the state, uh, the, the number of uh, particle stays fixed. Then it changes any time I switch to other parabola, which means that the charge is changing upon changing off and not in a discrete fa uh, fashion. Levels in this situation are almost pure charge states. Uh, the only quantum mechanics would come into play when these two levels cross by chance. And, well, we see quite many crossings. Uh, in this case, uh, these crossings are avoided um, instead of, uh, sorry, um, uh, the crossings are avoided, meaning that it's not actually uh, cross. If one looks at this in a smaller scale, one sees that these two levels um, are not crossed, they're separated by a small gap, and uh, here, when a small gap is formed, there are superpositions of the states with different charge. That's one situation, fixed charge. Uh, another situation is opposite of very much defined, uh, uh, of big law, uh, uh, Josephson uh, energy. All right, it would be enough for me to say that in this situation, the states of the island are very similar to the states of the oscillator. 
Oh, how come about in this case face is small? So instead of cosine, I would have uh, something proportional to phi squared. And the Hamiltonian would be a Hamiltonian of uh, an oscillator. Taking parameters of this oscillator, one can estimate the quantum fluctuation of phase in the ground state. And indeed, it is more than one. And the same for charge. And this fluctuation is much bigger than one. The product is again on the rotor fan, as we expect for coherent state or um, a state which minimizes uncertainty between uh, phase and number of particles. Fine, I guess this is roughly what I uh, wanted to say. Sorry for some delay. Let me just uh, finish with some, um, this couple of uh, phrases which conclude the lesson. Let me compare this uh, device, Cooper Bar Bar Box, and actual oscillator. Here we've been dealing with coherent uh, states of matter, the superconductivity. But at least if uh, energy, uh, Johnson energy dominates, uh, the resulting states are in fact very similar to oscillation states. And uh, in fact, it is um, also so that the resulting uh, circuit is very similar to a uh, classical oscillator, one just replaces Johnson junction with an inductance. Which means that there are approximate analogy between coherent states of matter and coherent states of radiation. Good. I guess uh, I finished the lecture. Thank you for your attention. Let me remind you that there will be homework deadline coming.